Let's go to the book of Hebrews for a little bit. All right, book of Hebrews, chapter number 10. And I may call from time to time, so you go, I'm going to ask forgiveness already up front, all right? So, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, here in this past, I don't know, six weeks or so, maybe not quite that long, four, five, six weeks, something like that, we've been talking a lot about, uh, I, I spent several weeks on that phrase in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, he shall save his people from their sins. And we looked at that in detail in many, many different aspects of salvation regarding, regarding that little phrase. And, of course, that's all about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he came to do, all those kind of things. Uh, and then last, last Sunday, we looked at, we, we get, did a little more focused on Bethlehem. And we talked about uh, the fields and what they meant. We talked about uh, the shepherds, what they meant. And then we, we in the heart of that, we, we talked about the um, didn't we? All right. Well, this past Wednesday, uh, I continued that a little bit. I don't know if you if you caught that, but but the lamb and 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 we went from Matthew where we were talking about the lamb and Luke where we were talking about the lamb and went over to the book of Revelation and how many times that name lamb is mentioned throughout Revelation and uh, and and that title that's given to the Lord, uh, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's the Lamb, and uh, and you see that all the way from I think about chapter number five or seven of revelation all the way up to chapter 22 and you'll see that that lamb mentioned many many times and i thought today what we would do and and today is something a little special for us we we do this about once a quarter uh, but today is the lord's supper or communion and i wanted to try to tie all of this together into one message all right and so how in the world are we going to do that i don't know we we'll, we'll just sit back and we'll try to do that okay and, uh, but let, let's start here in Hebrews chapter number 10, and I'm going to spend the majority of my time here, and then toward the end we're going to go look at a couple other passages. Um, but in Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 1, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, again, this is talking about, we've talked about the offerings. We've talked about sacrifices. We've talked about the lambs and, uh, and how they would never satisfy uh, the holy God. And this is what it's saying here. Now, in verse number 2, For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that uh, the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world. Now this is going to be our key verse here. Ready? Wherefore, when he cometh into the world. When do you think that's talking about? You remember what we talked about last week? Where did he come into the world? Where? It was Bethlehem. It was the manger. All right. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith. Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of a book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein which were offered by the law, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins forever sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore the Holy Ghost is also a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their heart, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And we'll stop right there. All right, so 
we've talked about, and let's go back to verse number 5, and this is kind of where I want to key in for a little bit. It says, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, we looked at that last week. You remember that? When he cometh into the world. How did he come into the world? He was born of a virgin. He was born in a manger. He was, you know, there in Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, Bethlehem Ephrata. Remember that? We, we looked at that meaning of that. That's going to come into this here in just a moment. And uh, but that's where God chose to bring his only begotten son into the world. And this is what it says. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not. When did he say this? When he came into the world. But a body thou hast prepared me. All right, and this is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you think about that body, that body... Uh, it came along. It was not uh, a man-made body per se. I mean, it was flesh and blood just like you and I have. But this was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Remember this? It was conceived of the Holy Ghost. It was formed in the womb of a virgin. And uh, so there are some similarities that we're going to get to with this body to you and I. But then there's also some differences. And uh, so we'll look, at, we'll look at some of those, all right? And so now uh, let's go back to verse number 12. And it says this, and every priest standeth daily ministering and oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin, but this man. And, uh, and, and we can tie that to that word body. Uh, this body, it was a man. It was flesh and blood just like you and me. All right? This is not glorified flesh. This is flesh just like you and I. As a matter of fact, look at Hebrews chapter 2, just over a few pages there. It says this, Hebrews 2, verse 14, it says, For as much then as, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, this is God's children here, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise, this is Jesus, he also himself likewise took part of the same. What does that mean? He took part of the same. He took part of the same flesh and blood. All right? That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now we'll talk about that here in just a moment again, I do believe. But now, I want us to understand that the flesh and blood that the Lord Jesus Christ roamed this earth in is the same type of flesh and blood that you and I have. Alright, this is a body. Alright, and this body was prepared for a special purpose. And uh, this body would be born. We looked at that in Bethlehem. This body would die. This body would be resurrected. As a matter of fact, this body would ascend into heaven. His resurrection was not just a spiritual resurrection. It was a bodily resurrection. There are some people who teach that, that there was just a spiritual resurrection. No, 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 no. Don't be mistaken. This was a bodily resurrection. And as the disciples saw him ascend into glory, that was a literal body of flesh and blood. That's what that was, all right? As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse number 11, it says, As they saw him go, in like manner, he will return. So when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not going to be just a spirit being. It is going to be the body, the flesh, and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we're going to see when he returns. All right? So th this is a body. So there are some similarities that we have. It is flesh and blood. It is a body just like you and have. You and I have. That, that's what he had. But here's the differences. Now look in verse number 7. Now uh, when it, in regard to this body. <coughs> <coughs> then said I, lo, I come in the volume of a book. It is written to me. What is he saying? To do thy will, O God. Now, I want you to understand something that within this body of flesh that the Lord Jesus Christ did, had or possessed, uh, that in every way he did God's will within that body. There's not a single one of us can say that every single step of my life that I've done God's will. There's not a single one of us. Otherwise, we would be without sin, and then we would make God a liar. There's not a single one of us that are without sin. But this man, that's verse 12. But this man, he lived, he lived and, and he did God's will on a continual basis. There are so many verses I could give you. Um, do you remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he was about to go to the crucifixion? Remember, remember this? What was his prayer? All oh, that cut past from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. He was always doing God's will. 
As a matter of fact, John 8, 29, it says, I do always those things that please him. Interesting. Always those things that please him. Do you remember, I believe it was at the, uh, at the baptism, and there was the voice of heaven, and what did it say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It was within this body. This is the difference between you and I, and, and, and not, not me and you, but us and him. This is the difference between us and him, is that he lived in obedience, in constant obedience, in constant communion with the Father, with, sinless, if you would. It also says it there in verse number, uh, let me see here. And, uh, and then said I, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. All right, so he's doing something with this. There's a purpose for this body. And, uh, and again, but I do want us to understand that the meaning of this body is it was a literal body. It was human flesh. That, that's what this was. There are a lot of similarities, but I'm going to tell you there's a big difference. And, and that difference was obedience. That difference was continual and utter obedience. He came to do God's will. In this body, there was no sin. There was no guile. There was no corruption. It was perfect in every way. It was sinless. It was holy. It was obedient. And he was doing God's will continually. And let me just say that this body was going to accomplish something that none of the other sacrifices could accomplish. He, he, he was, it was going to accomplish what all those other lambs and all those sacrifices could not. Let me just look at, look at it. Verse number 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. You with me? It is not possible. That's what it says. That the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In other words, he's saying, you know, the blood of bulls and goats is not good enough. He's saying, but there's a body that God has prepared. There's a body that God has prepared. And that body is the body that Jesus Christ took the form of. He's the one that was born in the manger. He was born, he was one that was uh, died on Calvary. He's the one that was resurrected. He was the one that ascended. He's the one that's returning bodily, bodily. And, uh, and so, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, look in verse number 3. But those sacrifices, there, were, there is a remembering again of, every, of, of sins every single year. In other words, all the lambs, all the bulls, all the goats, everything that had been sacrificed. What happens? Every year those sins were remembered. But look what's going to happen in, uh, in verse number 17. When, when this body is sacrificed and their sins and iniquities will I remember every year? Is that what it says? No, it says... No more. No more. And so that is the meaning of this body. Now let's look at the ministry of this body. All right? The ministry. And I hope you understand that the, the number one ministry of this body was sacrifice. If you go and look, look at this particular passage, you'll see that word sacrifice, verse number one. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices. He's doing a comparison here. A comparison. And, uh, and that sacrifices... Uh, which they offered year by year continually, making the making they, they could never make the comers there into perfect. All right, uh, and then verse number three is mentioned again for those sacrifices. Verse number five, and now comes the sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Verse number six, in burnt offering and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Verse number eight. Above when he said, sacrifice an offering, a burnt offering, an offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein. Verse number 11, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Verse number 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, Forever sat down on the right hand of God. I think that we could understand that this body, and we're looking at this body, uh, there is a major impact of the ministry of this body, and this, the ministry of this body was sacrifice. It was sacrifice. As a matter of fact, when you go and look at even in verse number 1, it talks about the shadow of good things to come. That shadow was all those lambs that had come before. 
That shadow was all the ceremonies that had come before. That shadow was all the symbols that had come before. That was the shadow. But now the reality of all that God was saying was here. This body that was prepared to do away with all that old stuff and and institute the new covenant. I mean, those things were remembered every year. I mean, never wash away sins. But now, Jesus Christ, the body that God prepared for him, now it was going to be the one that was going to be the sacrifice that was going to take away the sins, not just for a year, but forever. As a matter of fact, the sins and iniquities, he says, I will remember no more. And so, the ministry of this body is the ministry of sacrifice. Also, the ministry in this body is to serve. Look in verse number 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now, throughout this passage, I'll go back and read all of this. But you have the work of the high priest. You have that. And I think this is alluded to many times throughout this passage. And what the high priest did is he actually went to God on behalf of the people. That's what he did. All right? He would make the sacrifices for the people. He, he went to God uh, in lieu of the people. The people could not stand before God. He would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, and he would sprinkle that blood sacrifice, uh, in, 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 in other words, in intercession uh, or for payment, for atonement, for the sins of all the people. That's what the work of the high priest did. Now look, this is the same work. Do you realize that Jesus is our great high priest? He, this is a ministry not only of sacrifice, but this is also a ministry of service. Now, in his service, he served men, all right? He served men. Now, when you think about his ministry and his life, uh, he, uh, think about all the miracles that he did for people. Think about all the healing. Think about all the salvations. Think about the preaching that he did. Think about all the, <coughs> all the things that he did for man. Not only that, but he was going to God on behalf of man. He was a servant for man. But then at the same time, he was serving the Lord. He did always those things that were pleasing to him. He always did the, the, the will of God. He obeyed the law. He served completely and, and completed the law in every way. And so this was, and again, verse number 12, but this man offered one sacrifice for sins forever and sat down on the right hand of God. And that sacrifice, we understand, is himself, is that body. He, he was the high priest, and uh, he offered himself as that sacrifice, the only one that could take away sin and, uh, in service of God and in service of man to provide the way of salvation and, uh, <coughs> and fulfillment to the will of God at the same time. All right, so this is the ministry to sacrifice and to serve. But then also, uh, th- there's a word here. Look in verse number five. Let's look at this. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Now look in verse number 10. By the which, or other words, by this body which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now again, those old sacrifices every single year, all the time, making a remembrance of sin, reminding them how sinful they were, and, and, and how inadequate those sacrifices were. But then the body of Jesus Christ came along, it was for a prepared body, and it was to take away the sins once and for all, and it was to sanctify people. Now this word sanctify, sometimes we think about sanctification as, as being made better, or being more and more like Jesus Christ. This one is actually set apart, set apart from the world. If you would, that's what this word means. And, uh, and so setting apart, if you would, uh, by the body, the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're no longer like everybody else. We're no longer like the world. We're set apart from the world. We're set apart from sin, set apart for service for him, set apart uh, to be glorified with him at a later date. All right. So to be sanctified. And, uh, and, and let me read one verse over here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. This again is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a passage on the resurrection. All right, But in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 21, it says this. For since by man came death, how did death come upon all men? Sin. And who introduced that sin? Adam did. All right, so look, here we go. Uh, 
verse number 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection. You remember, but this man. Remember over in verse 12? That's what this man is talking about. All right? For since by man came death, that's Adam. By man came also the resurrection of the dead, that's Jesus. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's what this sanctification is talking about, being set apart, being, being made different. All right? Now, and let me just say, without this sanctification or without this justification in your life, I'm going to tell you, there's no escape without the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no escape. There's no escape. This is the only body that will ever save you. The only body. There's no escape without this body. As a matter of fact, this body that God prepared would be the body that would taste death for every man. This body would be the body that all sin of all mankind would be laid upon. Remember, it was perfect. It was sinless. It was in every way. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us, but, but he made him to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. He laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's what it said. That's what this body is. As a matter of fact, the wrath of God that is due to all of us was poured out upon him at Calvary. On that body. That prepared body. So this is the ministry of that body. Okay? It is a ministry of sacrifice. It is a ministry to serve. It is a ministry to sanctify. It's set apart. All right? But then there's a message of this body. All right? And I want to go over uh, to a passage over in Luke chapter 22. The Lord Jesus Christ is actually going to mention his body. All right, he's going to mention this body. And as a matter of fact, his disciples, he and his disciples, are celebrating Passover. I hope if you've been here at church any length of time, you, you know what the Passover is. It was the time in Egypt, the very last plague before they would be released, before they would be delivered from Egyptian bondage. And the lamb had to be sacrificed. You remember that? And the, door, and, the, and the blood had to be placed upon the door, the door lentils and the, and the post and all that. And, and the Bible says that when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that became the Passover, remember? Now, that was instituted as a feast that, that all Israel was supposed to remember every single year at that specific time. I think it's in Exodus 12. You can go read it if you want. But that was instituted. And now we're entering that time when that, in, in the season where they were reading here in Luke chapter 22, where the Passover was taking place. And they're celebrating the Passover together. You remember? He and his disciples go to the upper room. And so what has to be killed that night? A lamb. There are some other elements that I don't have time to bring into today, but there's just a couple that I'm going to bring in. One of them was bread. All right. One of them was unleavened bread. Now, and in that unleavened bread, there are several symbols that go along with this. If you go and look at account in Exodus, that some people believe that the reason that they used, uh, and, and I can kind of go along with this a little bit, but the reason that they used unleavened bread is because they, didn't, they did it in haste, so they didn't have weight. They didn't have time to wait to let the yeast rise and, you know, and, and do that so that they could cook bread like that. And, and there's nothing to be said about that because the Bible tells us that they're supposed to have their clothes on. They're supposed to have their shoes on. They're supposed to be ready to go when they're eating the Passover. Why do you think that is? Because God was getting ready to do something. God was getting ready to send them out of Egypt. And they had to be ready to move with haste. All right, so there is something to be said about that. But then also, the unleavened bread, it also has to do with sin. Anytime in the New Testament where, unleavened, where, where leaven is mentioned, it always has to do with sin. And we preached on this recently, I think in the last year. But we talked about the leaven of, of the Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of, the, of Sadducees. And every single one of those has to deal with hypocrisy or pride or, or something along those ways. False doctrine. <coughs> <coughs> But leaven always deals with sin. And so 
Now when we think about that unleavened bread that God had them prepare at the, at the Passover. Now, what do you think that represents? Now let's go to uh, Luke chapter 22, verse, verse number 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until, I, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now verse 19, let's look. It says, And he took bread. Now remember, they're, they're celebrating Passover. What type of bread is this? It's unleavened bread. And uh, so it can mean that they did that because they were in a hurry. Or it could also mean... That it represented sin. Now let's look a little closer here. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it. And gave unto them saying. This is my body. You remember that body that we looked at in, in Hebrews chapter 10. That it was prepared. You remember that? This is the same body we're talking about here. And it says here. This is my body. Which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Bread, and he would break that bread and pass it around. And, uh, and, and he would say in other places, this is my body which is broken for you. So when we think about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we think about that body, it was sinless, it was perfect, it was holy, it was always aligned with God's will, it was always in obedience to God. So if we take that leavened bread and we say uh, that unleavened bread and it was because that it, leaven represented sin and so this bread was without sin or this body was without sin. Does that make sense now? And so as they break that bread and they would pass that bread around and he says this is my body which is broken for you. For you. And so that body that was prepared who was it prepared for? Oh, it was a vessel that the Lord Jesus Christ would use to accomplish everything that the law had required. To be in full, complete obedience to God's will. But who was it prepared for? It was broken for who? For you. This body was without sin. Now, I want you to remember... And let's tie some things together here. Do you remember where he was born? Bethlehem Ephrata. You remember that? We talked about that last week. This is the house of abundant bread. Do you remember as he stood on the side of the Sea of Galilee? And he would say, I am the bread of life. Do you remember that? Remember that story? And now he's saying, this is my body which is broken for you. And all these things and all these shadows, if you would, are coming down to this one thing of reality. Of who Jesus really was and what he was doing. And what he was going to accomplish. For you and for me. So, and again, it says here, let's go back to verse number 20, chapter 22, and it says, verse 19, the very last phrase, this do in remembrance of me. So we're about to take the Lord's Supper. We're about, we're about to pass those out, all right? But there's something that we're supposed to remember, and it says, in remembrance of him. And so, as we look back, I think we need to remember what Jesus did for us. We don't have to remember sins every year. He took away sins how long? Forever. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And it was because of the sacrifice of that body that sins are forgiven. He was a substitute. He took our place. He paid our sin debt. He tasted death for every man. The wrath of God that was due us was rolled upon him. Him. 
He took upon him all sin. He became sin for us. As a matter of fact, I want to go back. Hold your place there in Luke. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to go back and read in Hebrews chapter 2 again those verses that I've already read. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. It is through this body that he destroyed the power of death. It is through this body that he destroyed the power of the devil. That was a prophecy all the way back in Genesis 3.15. But then back in, he, back in Luke chapter 22, that's his body we talked about now. And then in verse number 20 it says, Likewise also... The cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, uh, again, there's two elements. Now, if you go back to Hebrews, we'll, we'll, we'll skip Luke right there for a moment. Let's go back to Hebrews just a moment. In verse number four, it mentions the word blood. It says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. But then, in a verse I didn't even read yet, verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see, it is through his blood this, this, that, we, that is represented here. Now, the fruit of the vine here, that was shed for me, this body that was broken for me, this blood that was shed for me and for you. By the way, the Bible tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It is but with his blood that he has bought us and he has purchased us. You remember the song that is sung, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so now I want us this morning to remember what Jesus did for us. Oh, that body that was prepared. It was prepared for him, but it was also prepared for us. The meaning of this body is that it was a literal body, flesh just like you and I have. But the ministry of this body through which he served in obedience to bring about sanctification, that's basically that's the ministry. But then the message is to you and I personally. The body that was prepared for you and me personally. And I want to tell you, it, for those of us who know Christ, I'm going to tell you it ought to leave us with a heart of gratitude like nothing else. Now, just like they were dressed to leave Passover, to go, I'm going to tell you, you and I have to examine ourselves. This is a time when we take the Lord's Supper of self-examination. Yes, we remember all that he did. But then it also tells us to do a self-evaluation, a self-examination of where we are. Do we truly know him? Have our sins been forgiven? Have we been washed in his blood? If you don't understand what that means, I'm going to tell you, I want to share it with you. If you don't understand what that means, you come see me afterwards. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. You come see me. We'll take God's word and show you. For those of us that know him, and we know what he's done for us, and we've been cleansed, and we've been washed, we still do a self-examination of how our fellowship is with him. We still do an upward look about how thankful we are for all that he's done for us. But not only that, the Bible says we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do the Lord's Supper. We're supposed to remember the Lord's Supper until he comes. So not only are we looking back, looking up, looking around, but we're looking forward at what Christ is going to do. in that same body that he left with, he's coming back with. And we're going to see him. Miss Cynthia, I don't think I'm going to do an altar service this morning. But this is what I want to do. I want our men to come, those who have been selected to come. And uh, inside uh, the pew there, there is a little personalized little communion cup, if you would. And if you could grab.